Hey everyone, welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 574 being recorded Thursday, February 13th, 2020. I'm Jim Tannis. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. And I'm Sebastian Peake. And we're glad you could join us. Uh, we normally record these on Wednesdays, although as was pointed out in the comments, we should probably just switch the day to Thursday because we... We've in recent weeks have had to had to push a few of them uh, frequently, but but normally Wednesday. And if, if you'd like to know when we go live, because we do stream these live uh, at uh, 10 p.m. Eastern, usually you can head over to pcpro.com slash subscribe where you can join our mailing list. It's a simple mailing list that we we don't we don't use it for advertising or marketing. It's just a, a text email that goes out a, an hour or two before each live stream and uh, let you know uh, exactly uh, what time it's going to be or if, if it's going to be postponed or whatever. And that also gives you a little teaser of the topics we're planning on covering that night. Uh, so uh, please uh, head over and check that out. Uh, also, of course, there's the Patreon at patreon.com slash PC per every penny you spend there goes directly to funding the operation of the site. So we really appreciate that. And of course, if you, uh, if you become our, our, our longstanding tradition is if you become a new patron during the live stream, or if you increase your pledge, uh, change the, if you want, change your name in the, uh, the Patreon name field. I'll get an email notification and I'll read out whatever you put in that name field uh, here. We usually catch those hopefully uh, in a timely manner. But because we missed a week, uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to some of the uh, new patrons for the last uh, week or so. Uh, we had... Uh, I don't want to give the full name because these came outside of the live stream and I don't know if, if they want me to read their full name, but I'll just say thanks to Brad, Christopher, and Gary for becoming new patrons in the last week or so. And of course, uh, a, a big shout out and a big thank you for his continued to, uh, support to Ken Likes Butt Stuff over at Patreon. Uh, now also, uh, of course, uh, our one of our regular hosts is Josh Walworth. You'll notice uh, his rectangle up there is uh is just his avatar his walrus uh persona he's unfortunately not with us tonight because it was a thursday he got called away to work so he's busy at his uh day slash now night job updating enterprise servers so sacrificing the chicken did not work he's currently chasing a buffalo there you go so uh best wishes to josh there but uh, let's jump into the show we've got a lot to talk about that we've missed and uh First, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, apparently first. Alan's cat is, is happy that we're on tonight. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. That's, is that the, the cat of Melvin Tano? Yeah, with the caption, I can has PC for a podcast. There he goes. You'd think he'd have something better to do with this time. But anyway, exactly. uh, uh, let's jump into the news. We've got, uh, of course, the probably the biggest story of the last week or so was the launch last Friday. Was it Thursday or Friday? What day was the seventh? Friday. Last Friday was the launch of the, uh, or no, help me out, guys. What day did the thirty nine ninety nine or thirty nine ninety X launch? I mean, that sounds. No, right. it wasn't seven they seven like, seven. They like seven. Okay. Well, at some point last week. The Threadripper 3990X launch, that's, of course, the top-end Threadripper for this generation. And it, of course, also takes the line to a whole new uh, level with 64 cores, 128 threads. And as if you're watching the video version, you can see we've got a screenshot of just what that looks like inside the Windows Task Manager. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty crazy. I mean, that, that, that is the same core and thread count as their top-end Epic parts this generation as well mm -hmm. now there are some differences which we'll talk about of course between threadripper and epic. gpus with less cores yes <laughs> but uh but the, the, that's the the new the new processor's out and it's out at an appropriately priced three thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars and uh you know happy to say that inventory or, or stock is, has been good uh they didn't sell out on launch day uh it's probably it's a combination of this being a higher price point that obviously most people can't can't afford but also yeah. AMD ramping up their inventory because we've seen good stock of of all of these higher end Ryzen and Threadripper parts uh, recently uh so there's there's uh, good stock as of today there were still about 10 or so at our local micro center and uh Amazon has had them on and off and and uh, we've seen people picking them up at Fry's and 
and stuff. So if you do want to get one of these processors, there's a good chance you can get it at retail price, uh, which is great. Uh, but of course, the I think the the caveat here is that because this has reached such a high core count, it's not the perfect processor for the ultimate workstation, depending on what you want to do. I mean, I had, when I heard of this, I had dreams of, um, you know, an ultimate video editing setup. And looking at the early benchmarks, this is probably not your best bet because in most applications like Premiere, it's either not as, it's either as fast as its cheaper counterparts, the 3960, 3970, or it's even slower in some cases because of those lower clock speeds to accommodate all those extra cores. Uh, so you just got to be careful with what your what your planned use case is. This may not be the best bet unless you have a truly multi-threaded application. The other uh, slight negative and are willing seen, to pay as much as the model number. Well, of course, too. But I mean, when you look when you look at the potential performance compared to the price, this is pretty good all things considered, looking at previous generations of workstation class processors uh, from Intel in particular, you're getting a whole lot for your money. It's just a matter of balancing uh, the core count and, and frequencies. Uh, but the other limitation, of course, we've seen is that, uh, like the other Threadrippers, you're limited to 256 gigabytes of memory, which is unusual in the sense that at workloads where you normally see these core and thread counts, you're talking servers and stuff. So you have, you know, up to a terabyte or more uh, of memory capacity that you can use. And here you're, you are limited. So again, looking at what your workloads are, if you're someone who was interested in an Epic part and then sees this and thinks this could work for you, make sure that what you want to do can accommodate that, that lower RAM because the, the Epics give you more RAM. And then on the Intel side, of course, their new Xeon workstation parts can go up to a terabyte, I think. Right, Sebastian? Yes, yeah. one terabyte capacity there. So, yeah. Well, you, there's uh, got to be or, or above differentiation. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, and that's why yes. Nvidia yeah. won't let you install the game driver on a professional card or the professional driver on a game card. And AMD is just, yeah, will physically limit your RAM. Yeah. So that's that's the the trade off. That's why we can see a 64 core, 128 thread part at this price when the Epics are going for about seven thousand. For that yeah. same core count, uh, but again, the 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 the, the, the overall story of, of this whole Epic and Threadripper saga has just been the the value. I mean, those are big numbers; those are big dollar numbers. But compared to the performance you got a couple generations ago from Intel or or uh, AMD, even you're getting a whole lot more for those those price points. So. If you have a truly multi-threaded application and the RAM limit isn't a problem, this is a great part. It's it's nothing that we've seen indicates that it's anything but other than a, a great continuation of that epic, uh, or I'm sorry, the uh, Threadripper uh, uh, line. Uh, but just like I said, just make sure you you take into account uh, those limitations. Uh, I get the good news for AMD though is if if those limitations are a problem for you in terms of um, especially in terms of performance for things that aren't that multi-threaded the the next best choice is still an amd part it's still the 3970 True. or a, you know maybe even a 39 a ryzen 3950 if, if you want the higher frequencies so there, there's there's nothing to worry about here from from amd's perspective they've they've hit it out of the park again with this part and and you can buy them that's great you can yep. you don't have to and to agree with jim you would be absolutely nuts to do this but a couple of sites did gaming benchmarks and guess what it's actually pretty damn good like some of the previous thread rippers significantly tilted towards the uh performance for workstation stuff not so much for gaming you were you were so much better off getting a ryzen well you still are considering the price difference but it, it just sort of looking at you know, this is games don't usually the, there's what game is going to deal with 128, 20 or bleh, all of these cores. It, it just is not going to happen. 128 cores is just going to go insane. You're going to be fighting because it just wants core one or core zero. But amazingly, you know, in this architecture, they've had to increase their single thread performance a bit and it's, it's worked. So again, yeah. don't buy it for gaming. You're, you're nuts. <laughs> But yeah. if you're 
spend your evenings gaming and you've got the money to shell out for this sort of thing for a workstation, that's actually not going to be such a bad thing. <laughs> and, and don't yeah. even ask how much the TRX 40 other ports are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for a good one, you're going to spend another six, seven, eight hundred dollars or more. <laughs> but hey, it's a workstation and you're buying this if you want core and thread count above everything else. And like both of you have said, like the, the Ryzen stuff is great. In fact, to Jim's point, the 3950X is probably more than what most people would even need. And sure, you're not going to get anywhere near the performance of 64 cores or even 32 cores with the Threadripper 3970X this generation. But same architecture and for 749 bucks, because now it's pretty commonly available at MSRP, you're getting something that costs a little over half of what the entry-level Threadripper costs. You can get great motherboards for half of the cost of a new platform Threadripper board because you do have to buy a new board. Even if you were on X399, that doesn't work anymore. You've got to get a new platform. So the, the cost of ownership of Threadripper is, is high, and you need to be able to justify it probably from the standpoint of how much is your time worth getting stuff done faster. I don't remember the name of the movie studio, but they had some, uh, you know, AMD sponsored uh, look behind the scenes of uh, production of a recent movie where they were talking about ridiculous savings in time oh, and other people were going yeah. home earlier in the day and the work that used to take, you know, an hour was taking just a few minutes now. So that kind of stuff's absolutely possible if it's optimized. Like we could run Blender and just see amazing differences. But if you're living in Adobe applications, those are a little bit burstier. They're not taking advantage of all the cores and you're not getting a huge benefit. In fact, you may actually get better performance with a 3950X just because of the higher clocks. So, and, you know, it's it's amazing to me that they've even done this. And I was amazed at the price. That $4,000 may seem like a lot of money. It's not if you're talking about professional workstations, especially when the company's buying it and not you. If you can justify it to the boss, you're probably going to get one. It's going to save them money in the long run because you can get more stuff done in a day. But four thousand dollars, there's no markup between that uh, and the thirty nine seventy X. You're paying two thousand dollars for a thirty two core part, or four thousand dollars for a sixty four core part. That's crazy. Think about the premium that was always attached to these high core count processors uh, on like the Intel high end desktop side. It was just nuts. Getting to six cores, you were spending a huge premium, and even on the desktop side, they charge a slight premium to go from twelve to sixteen cores. Uh, with Ryzen 3000. It's only a few bucks, but it's like $5 a core you're paying to get to that 16 core mark. And there's no increase here. So it's it's like this weird Halo product that's not overpriced at all. And you can put together a very, very powerful workstation for less than the cost of like, well, let's look at the Mac Pro, obviously. $6,000 is the entry yeah. level. And that's very hobbled as far as memory support because of the the fragmentation, the segmentation that Intel does on that side of things. So it's kind of mind boggling, really. And it's not for us. Like if a desktop enthusiast, it's not I'm not buying a four thousand dollar processor. I don't even have four thousand dollars into my entire gaming setup, including monitor. But uh it's just this uh, weird time. If you that told we're in me right two now. years ago that this is what the market would look like, I, I would have suggested you go visit a psychiatric hospital. Right. Like this is almost supercomputer level just a couple years ago. Like, yeah. hey, they're they're and working it's on AMD, this not Intel. technology. Right. Wait, wait, AMD is the one that's the head and thread counts and process technology and, and Intel is slashing prices to compete with them. Yeah, buddy, uh, you need to go sit in a corner somewhere for a bit. It's, it's like AMD developed this little chiplet that has very nearly the IPC of current gen Intel stuff. And <laughs> they're going to put a whole bunch of them together on this one uh, processor and it's going to go up to 64 cores. Yeah, I mean, no, you know, you're thinking of ARM and like putting a whole right. bunch together. No, this is. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderfully crazy. I mean, it's it's a new uh, it's a new platform, a new a new high, for, in terms of price for the workstation, 
because Intel's HEDT parts topped out at about two thousand dollars prior to this, Correct. and yeah. and so as a workstation, it's a new high. But at this level of core count, I mean, we there's been some rumblings about Intel drastically trying to get their customers better pricing behind behind the scenes. But Intel's top end processors, which do not match the performance of this part, cost twenty thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> And of course, now, publicly, publicly, and, and yes. work better in pairs. Yes, yes. So I mean, th this is uh, right. Like, like Sebastian said, this this is a, a totally new, a new era, a new level. And the the only sad part about this is that, and I don't want this to be taken the wrong way, but is that it doesn't look like Intel is going to be able to compete for a while at this at this level. Um, we're, we're waiting to see how everything pans out with their shift to 10 nanometer and how that gets pushed down and then they're continuing uh, advancements to other nodes, but they, they can cut prices and everything. And then, as we've always said, if you have those certain workloads that are, are tuned for Intel's uh, advantages like AVX 512 stuff, then obviously that works in, but, but there's from the vast majority of customers, there's probably no reason to go Intel at this point. Uh, AMD is your best choice at almost every price point at every performance level. And that's, I mean, that's, that's incredible. So, and, and I just, and the reason I said it's sad that Intel's not competing is I want competition. I want these companies to be fiercely competitive because that drives low, even lower prices, even more innovation. Uh, and we'll get there at some point, but, but for now, uh, victory lap for AMD for sure. But uh, looking at the other side of this, we talked about the $4,000 flagship Halo product. Let's talk about something that's arguably even more interesting because it's so much more attainable. And that's the Ryzen 5 1600, but not the Ryzen 5 1600, the Ryzen 5 1600 AF. Mm -hmm. That's Ryzen AF, as... AF indeed, yeah. Jim, it's in cool the vernacular of, of young people and... 2020. So we had the original Ryzen 5 1600. We've had a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Ryzen 2600. Uh, what is going on with this $85 Ryzen part, Jeremy? I will admit that I have complained in the past about iterative upgrades, uh, be it GPUs or CPUs, because generally it's dirty pool when the company is doing it. In this case, what's happened is the original R5 1600 AE was done on the 14 nanometer line. It, the 14 nanometer line in AMD is, you know, it's pretty much being mothballed. There's just a couple of things that they're building it on, but, you know, it's not really worth it. So they took the R5 1600 and retooled it and started running it on the 12 nanometer line. Now, if you look directly at the specs, that makes it, an R5 2600. It, it makes it essentially the, the next generation. There is a bit of a change in that the clocks are not quite as high. Uh, you're looking at 3.4 uh, base, 3.7 boost, drop down to 3.2, 3.6, which, to be honest, is not going to make a hell of a lot of difference for you. But other than that, the case stays the same. The uh, memory support stays the same. The wattage stays the same. The price for an R5 2600 when it was launched was 200 bucks. You can find the Ryzen 5 1600 AF for $85 or so. Yeah. And as someone pointed out to me, it has the Wraith Stealth Cooler, not the Spire Cooler that the original one was shipped with, which makes it easier to spot. If you're running a 2600, it's not going to be an upgrade. If, on the other hand, you are running some, uh, an older generation R5, or for that matter, even an R5 1600 original edition, it, it's 85 bucks. It's for less than 100 bucks, boom, drop it in, and away you go, and you will see a significant boost. Well, okay, maybe not a significant, but it's, it's a nice boost. Well, think if about this. If you're running something older, it's yeah, an yeah. It, or if you're not even on a Ryzen platform at all, think about like say you're on an older Intel system, and you've 
you're like, okay, I've been waiting long enough. Like we have plenty of people who are on like a core i5, like Haswell era system. Cause those were damn good. And they were great for gaming for a long time. And if you're looking at moving up to a, a faster GPU and you don't want to be held back and you don't want to worry about bottlenecks, you're not going to be bottlenecked by a second gen Ryzen six core processor for gaming. And oh. To, to build a new system, if you can go find like a, a cheap but good AM4 board somewhere, it doesn't have to be the fanciest board or even an X series chipset. You get Don't one pay of those more for the motherboard this... than you did for the chip. Yeah, exactly. Get one of these eighty-five dollar totally processors. Spend yep. about eighty bucks on a motherboard, and for less than the cost of a new Core i5, you've got yourself your platform, and now you can upgrade your GPU and 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 save your money for those things that are actually going to improve your gaming experience and your cpu just gets out of the way i this is such a great deal it makes honestly and jimmy might want to make an edit point here it makes the 3000g seem like a piece of crap because they're selling <laughs> a dual core part for 50 dollars. their list price on that is 53 dollars and yet you can go out and get this zen plus six core 12 thread part for $85. And they didn't make a, a any kind of public announcement of this. It was just like observed, noticed, reported about that, hey, this AF variant is out there and we've actually looked into it and it's 12 nanometers, not 14. And it's Zen Plus and it's actually a 2600 with slightly lower clocks. And, slightly. you know, honestly, there 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 is a, a reason to buy the 3000G. Honestly, it hits a 35 watt uh, mark. And in fact, I have... This, which I actually forgot about, it's in a brown box, but this is an ECS mini PC designed for AMD processors, but it has a 35 watt limitation. It's power delivery, mm. the way it can manage thermal. So I actually have a perfect home for that 35 watt processor when I put this all together. So there's a there's a reason for that processor, but it's, it's a stretch if you're an enthusiast, you're like, oh, I don't have a lot of money, I need to put this new system together or you're building a system for a family member or something and you, you, you want them to have a little bit more compute power or maybe be able to game down the road. If I was building a system for my son today, he's only four. Let's say he's six, seven years old and he wants his own gaming PC or I want to get him off of mine finally, which currently he uses just to watch YouTube videos. Uh, I would build him a system with his AF in it. Absolutely. And some you know, mid-range graphics card and he'd be all set for a long time. So it's... I think this is one of those like seminal things. Like there, there's been a processor. It's typically been, I think, a lower cost Intel processor back in the Haswell era, especially. But yeah, like a Celeron getting your hands or an Atom is like, or something. Yeah, it's, it's this is the CPU that gets out of your way. It doesn't hold you back. Doesn't hold your GPU back. It's cheap. It's available and. If this was AMD strategy, it's brilliant because this corners the like the low end of the enthusiast market with something that is uh, a heck of a lot faster than anything you're getting from Intel at under a hundred dollars, certainly. So yeah, and and to your point about the pricing difference, um, I mean for sure, as an individual looking for a budget system, yes, whatever. I mean, at, at those budget prices, every dollar counts for sure, but. You save your money if you if you can and, and go for this over like a three thousand G. But but also I think the reason that exists is that thirty dollar difference or so does come into play with with bulk purchases. People oh, of course, putting together yeah. lots of systems. So and you know, and any of the thermally constrained systems that couldn't handle yeah. a sixty five watt CPU. I get it, and not everything can do so. It's certainly not a, a you know a brick powered mini PC like the CCS kit either. So but now all I'm looking forward to is the Zen 2 version of this chip. <laughs> Get that higher IPC, but that's for better much performance. Eh? Yeah. Well, we'll see. maybe throw in maybe throw in some uh, Navi graphics after mm -hmm. we have the new uh, consoles come out and we actually get some APUs with some GPU punch on the desktop side that can potentially finally answer that question like do you really need a dedicated GPU for gaming? And that'll be interesting. I, I'm looking forward to that. If it, if I'm excited about anything in the next year or so, it'll be APUs that are like significant uh, for gaming. But that'll be fun when it happens, if it happens. Well, uh, 
if you're looking at that price range, check out the yeah. Ryzen 1600 AF. Just make sure you, you do check to see that you're getting the, the new variant, not the original 16. Yeah, so look for the stealth cooler, apparently, and then double check the model, which I haven't right. done in so many years. Right. Um, all right. Our, our next story, real briefly, is a sad one. Uh, obviously, there's been some uh, concern worldwide about the, the uh, coronavirus and it's affecting travel and people are dying, of course, and, and uh, affecting the, the tech industry, which is so dependent on China. Uh, but it just claimed a, uh, a non-human victim in that Mobile World Congress, which is uh, the, the big mobile focus conference set to be held in Barcelona at the end of this month. I think it was supposed to start February 24th. Uh, but it has been uh, canceled. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of people saw that this was coming because a lot of the vendors, uh, I think it was less a concern about people being infected and more just the reality that a lot of companies had publicly said they were pulling out. And so for a conference like this, if you have a lot of your, you know, your big partners pull out, it, it just becomes unprofitable and untenable. Uh, so they've, they've canceled it. And uh, that of course, you know, is probably for the best, all things being considered here uh, with, with the, the actual, like I said, people dying, let's focus on that. But uh, it, it leads me to, to worry about other things that are happening later this year, because I've, I've seen some airlines, uh, U.S. airlines are currently under a, a travel restrictions to China. Uh, I think it was United recently said that they were extending their, their restrictions until April. And then, of course, we've got Computex in Taiwan in May, at the end of May, uh, I believe. And, uh, you know, what will happen there? What will happen with other conferences? Uh, Jeremy mentioned that they were canceling F1 races uh, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So uh, this will be interesting to see what impact, how long this this uh, crisis goes on, what effect it'll have on these on both these conferences as well as companies' ability to to manufacture and ship products. And then when you cancel a show like this, you know what what effect does that have going forward? Do do all the carriers and big partners who would have made their announcements do it themselves and decide that they can do it better? You know, like we've seen with E3 and, and, and what happened with Comdex back in the day. Do, you know, do companies, does canceling an event like this mean that it's more likely that it will never have another one? Uh, so I don't know. Uh, we'll see. But uh, no, so there won't be any news from Mobile World Congress. I, I was trying to think... Did, I mean, we haven't, obviously, since I took over. Did did Ryan, un, under the old regime, did anyone go to Mobile World Congress? You guys recall? We sent Ken. Was it Ken? Okay. So No, I don't want to go. I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> fucking send Ken. Yeah. <laughs> he, he probably wanted to go. No, Barcelona's not a bad place to, to go. Yeah. Even for work. But uh, speaking uh, of, or continuing on the theme of canceled things... No, uh, the real, you mean the real reason that they canceled the NWC? Yes, of course. We, Worldwide we, exclusive. You're going to hear it here, here first, folks. Yes, the real reason that it was canceled is because Essential is no more. The always interesting upstart creative, I don't know, how do you describe this? Uh, let me see words that come to mind. Overrated. Overrated. Uh, uh, never going to, never going to make it. Uh gimmicky yeah. gem phone product that was destined to fail never really well, existed did you ever did you see the gem by the way and i know i'm being snarky yeah. but never the gem was this ultra slim phone that was basically useless it looked like a a, a television remote control but it had a touch screen instead of buttons on one side <laughs> of course you know we'll never be in production past the prototype stage because the company fell like imploded before it could be released. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, uh, original essential phone, uh, won't be receiving any more updates. The PH one, it had an update on February 3rd, but that will be the last update. Uh, they are, um, putting the development tools on GitHub though. So there's a chance there could be some community created stuff. Going forward. Oh, come on. If you bought that phone, you're going to keep it alive until the very last second. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. You know, it was it was the first phone 
with a notch. They pioneered the notch before Apple released the iPhone 10. In fact, I bet Apple ripped them off. They I saw thought the I hated them before. Oh, they I... felt threatened. Andy Rubin was behind it. They're like, that son of a bitch. We're going to put a notch on our next phone. Tim Cook is like, that fucking Rubin, sorry, Jim, has screwed me for the last time. And I don't mean that literally. I mean it figuratively. I don't have any inside information about that. I, I've always been disappointed in in our favorite, you know, software developer that he didn't sue everyone who started using the phrase "notch." Ah, it was oh, his first. Well, he did, he sold it off. Did he sell the name "notch" to Microsoft along with my? Oh, I have no idea. Well, he still it tweets seems in character. That, so I that I was, yeah, they, so. that was hotly contested when during the negotiating. I need, I get to keep my Twitter account though. Yeah, seven billion dollars <laughs> later. Uh, was it so, only five? It, it, there's, it involved billions. It doesn't yeah. matter the number before it. But uh, yeah, so no more essential phone. And then, of course, uh, sort of uh, on the side of this was that they acquired uh, Newton Mail uh, a year or two ago. <laughs> and uh, so that app will be going dark. I think it's April 30th. <laughs> I missed that part. Of it. That's oh brilliant. my god, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that that didn't so, save the company. We no. guys, we bought something. It's called Newton. Uh, Andy, uh, I don't like figs. Man. Don't what are you doing in this industry? Remember Apple's Newton? Was he behind <laughs> Apple's Newton? Is that what this is all about? So, if you are a user oh, of Newton yeah. Mail, uh, I think they said April thirtieth is the the deadline nothing personal but there's something wrong with you <laughs> yeah well i mean i you know i i, I never used it i recall because i think it started on mm. mac or ios and i recall seeing some positive reviews of it but uh yeah all for not uh but uh let's continue on here we've got uh some news uh late breaking news from scott uh he's he uh, reported for us this evening that there's a new bug in Windows 7. So as you may recall, Windows 7 went uh, end of life last month. I think it was the 14th. And Microsoft said, hey, no more updates. And then immediately had to issue an update because there was a security vulnerability. And then, of course, well, there was and then they screwed up the screensaver and they had to patch that. And yes, there was another bug uh, which in which your, your desktop wallpaper would go black um, without being able to be fixed, uh, which was, which is actually a symptom of I think having an unactivated copy of Windows, your your desktop wallpaper yeah. is black. So no probably active something desktop for you, naughty boy. Yeah, something screwed up. Well, not active desktop. We've even well, Microsoft was... gave up on that. But oh, God, yeah, so they uh, are they they're still using active desktop. You can still get it. Oh wow, it's, a, it's something you can get from the store. But as uh, as Scott reports, there's uh, new reports uh, this this week that there's a shutdown bug where if you go to shut down Windows 7, it won't let you. And it's it seems to be from what people are finding that it, it for whatever reason, it it's asking for user privileges to shut down higher than admin privileges. So that's a problem. And uh, there's a group policy fix that's floating around, but that does apparently cause some side effects. If you are affected by this bug, uh, some workarounds are to first log out of your account and then use the shutdown feature from the login screen or uh, shut down from the task manager uh, interface instead of uh, the start menu. So yeah, some, uh, some bugs there for windows. Show us your shirt, Sebastian. Yes. That's the message they're all waiting for. It is now safe to turn off your computer. And it's now safe to continue running Windows 7, even though Microsoft would really rather that you didn't, to the tune of making you have that black screen bug and preventing yeah. normal operation of your system. You know, if you just upgraded to Windows 10, the fastest and best Windows ever that features always on key logging and an undefeatable Cortana digital assistant that does stuff in the background on two processes mm -hmm. all the time, even when you do everything you can to disable it. And even when you have every known Microsoft server blacklisted on your home network, it's still still doing stuff. Thanks, Microsoft. Hey, pretty soon they'll be pushing Windows 10 X on you. So. I know. But hey, I, I saw a headline for a premium Therat 
blog post that said Windows 10X is the next Windows NT. And, you know, as Windows NT, that's all about Windows business. RT. Oh, he said, he said RT? I have to read that again. Yeah, no, he didn't, but as long as he didn't. Oh, okay. Oh. He was a vocal detractor, I think, of RT, which, of course, went away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, eventually and, he was. I mean, I, I love Paul, but he, throughout his career, he has been very excited about things as they're under development at Microsoft and then they come out and there, there are issues and to his credit, he, he quickly turns on them and calls those issues out. But yeah, he's, he's been very, he's very high on, on this windows 10 X approach to Microsoft. Well, don't you think that's a key to access? Would you get access if you were shitting on it throughout the development cycle? You were very positive. In your email exchanges with people and the things that you report while you're getting access. And then when it comes out and it's public, yeah, then you can tell people what you really think. Well, if that's the case, he's, he plays that game very, very well. Um, all right, next up, we've got uh, some news from Jeremy here about uh, DRAM prices and the, the roller coaster of DRAM prices, right? Tell us. Oh, it's been, uh, yeah. And kudos to anyone who recognizes that roller coaster design. Uh, so about 18 months ago, two years ago, we were bitching and screaming that the price of RAM was insane. I, I, if you wanted to pick up DDR3 or DDR4, you were paying through the notes. Uh, Ryan's Law was nowhere near close to becoming a reality as SSDs were you know, sort of less expensive, but nowhere near the prices that we got to enjoy, say, 18 months ago, a year ago, and that we've gotten used to, where all of a sudden, you know, 10 cents a gig happens. Uh, sometimes not even on sale, depending on what uh, sort of uh, NAND technology you're willing to put up with. DDR4, the prices are, are literally about half of what we were paying. Uh, when it was when it was coming out, and through a, a variety of things, uh, up to and including, you know, no one's buying extra RAM to run Bitcoin uh, miners, and a variety of other crashes in the cell phone market, so that uh, newer models with high counts of RAM were not being bought. It was the cheaper models. The demand started to trickle down, uh, but the supply was still there. Since then, of course, the, the supply has started to dry up because why in the hell would we keep making RAM if we're not making all that much money off of it? And so it's looking, it's not guaranteed, but it is looking like over the next year or so, we're going to see uh, a spike up. There's been some very large companies like uh, Amazon, uh, the, the search provider in China that I can't think of the name of right now. Uh, I do. What? Or Bi- well, Baidu, is it Weibo? Or- yeah, and so they're, they're scooping up servers. Uh, there's a variety of other places that are, that are scooping up servers. Uh, the next This generation of cell phone, honestly, because they're just only making high counts of RAM, uh, you know, there is now a nice demand for RAM. So its chances are really good that we're going to start seeing the price of everything spike up. So if you're on on the edge about buying yourself a, a nice big SSD, a RAM upgrade, I it sounds sort of like it's a good idea to consider buying it now, or at least in the near future. Because uh, this isn't just one or two different uh organizations saying it. it's like the semiconductor industry association it's it's a bunch of varieties of them and you've seen almost every provider uh so samsung hynix micron like their sales have dropped like 37 to 33 percent it, it's really really hurting them uh and then the same with flash so they've cut a lot of the supply and it looks like yeah Welcome back to the upwards part of the rail or the royal the the roller coaster. But the suggestion here is that if we don't get a good price on our SSD, we should gracefully expire. 
Isn't this the suicide roller coaster? It is indeed the suicide roller coaster. Okay. It, it seemed better than just. Hey, like the buy a RAM before you die. Down. Buy it now before you die. You, you could die hey, tomorrow. Buy it now you know, before your opportunity dies was sort of the. What I, I was gotcha. trying to give the people the idea of. Gotcha. Not to mention, I just love the idea of that roller coaster. Yes, it is. It is a funny <laughs> thought. <laughs> and you could have enough momentum. You're not allowed to build it in roller coaster. I type feel like it would have enough momentum. We should build it and try it out just to get through all those loops. Yeah, just once. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, well, well, whenever this this uh, organization comes to an end, that'll be our final video. We'll yes. All live stream our testing. As is tradition. But, uh, all right, next up, we've got uh, some, uh, well, we talked about the coronavirus earlier as related to the World Congress, and perhaps it's having even more effect on a long, I don't even know if I want to say long-awaited, but a long-in-the-making product. Totally the reason that you're not able to buy a VCS right now, yeah. Um, Yeah. So this yeah. is the Atari VCS console, the thing that's been uh, teased and and talked about for was it four years? I, it's it's right there in Strike Through. Oh, okay. I so. was going to say if, <laughs> if you just listen to this podcast, and you know some of you do, and that's great. Definitely go to the website and read this article. If you don't read any others, just to see the eloquent. I can only describe it as eloquent use of Strike Through text by Jeremy in this post here. He takes you on a journey of disappointment and betrayal with strike through and plain text. You just have to see it to, to believe it. Yeah. Maybe and, just don't let your kids grow up to be pre-orderers. Right. I, I right. did not realize that the price had also grown as oh, it was I, delayed further and further back. Not just the system, but the controller as well. I mean, $110 for the controller seems so reasonable now. Absolutely. That, that the system has gone up like 40% in price since originally. Up for Remember pre-order. the Phantom <laughs> Gaming Console? Every time I hear something about the VC. Oh, oh was, was that a, like the, the late 90s? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it, it was promised to change. Every, it was about the same time that Nokia launched their N-Gage. Uh, which actually did make it to market for the yes about the amount of sales that the Zoom got, maybe a bit less, but yeah, it, it was supposed to be this amazing console and wonderful and brand new, and it never happened yeah. because it was perfectly named. Well, I'm sorry, I this just sounds like another excuse as to how it is that. The ZX Sinclair reboot, or sorry, I mean the uh, Atari VCS will never happen. Because this has been common for a lot of these reboots. that They've gone horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been rough, a rough journey. And, and just to kind of recap real quick, if, if you don't remember, this is the in the mold of the NES Classic and the, you know, the Sega Genesis Classic and all these these classic consoles that are coming back in mini form. Uh, this was a project to bring back the original Atari, but to add some more functionality. So, of course, it would play original like 2600 games, but also as as time went on and the price went up, it would also like be a media streamer, so you could like run apps on it, like Netflix and stuff. Uh, but of course, as Jeremy points out, uh, it it's been delayed multiple times. The price has changed multiple times. As the most recent uh, launch date was March 2020. Uh, so next month, but they've come out now and said they're not going to hit that because, and, and this is the, the blame this time, the reason for, for Jeremy's skepticism uh, because of all these other delays is, is that they've blamed the coronavirus and saying that they don't have people in their factories and they just can't get product and materials shipped because of everything shut down. And, and that could very well be the case. But at the same time, you know, the, the, they, they don't have a track record of hitting their goals and hitting their, their promises. So, well, I mean, it's very true that Northern China, including Wuhan province is where the vast majority of the manufacturing is and that they've locked people to their factory for relatively good reasons. Don't think the month or two that they've been, well, it's not even been a month. That they've been locked out has suddenly stopped all production and it's totally not going to make it. We, we were just that far away and suddenly 
I'm sorry. I don't, I, I'm sorry, Atari. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I don't know. Nope. So what oh. happens when you cry wolf is that even if this is legitimate, it still looks a little too convenient for them. Yeah. But at some point, this is just going to become a mini PC with some sort of awkward living room front end. They're trying to make it everything. I'm sure they're desperate at this point. Like, how are we going to sell this? How are we going to market this? I, how would they market this? And Nintendo did a really great job with their mini consoles. They're yes, nostalgic, they but they, they pick games that are fun, that people remember. But even if you had never played them before, you could still pick them up. I mean, it'll be a very, very... Uh, it'll be a dose of reality to pick up... Uh, what is it? Ghosts and Goblins... The first time, if you've ever played that game, oh yeah, it will kick your ass. I love ass. watching a naked knight run around with a light. Yeah, you get hit once, you lose your hands. armor. You get hit twice, you're dead. You're dead. You have to beat the yeah. entire game, all six levels, two times in a row to actually beat the game. And there's no... I don't think you even get infinite continues. You just get a straight-up game over screen and start over from the very beginning. Yes, so, yes, you yeah, are The games used to be really tough, and but they were still charming. It's They're extremely well-realized systems. And they're around $79 from Nintendo. Uh, the latest mini console, the Sega, the officially authorized Sega mini console, it's okay. I have that. And I'd say it's maybe worth $40 or $50, but it's it's good. And, and you think about what, what could we have, like a little miniature Atari with wood grain, simulated wood grain, and you know have all those classic games people could feel nostalgic about. I don't really know how well they hold up anymore. Compared, like maybe some of them, of course, are iconic, but well, I mean, you can get a retro pie and play all these games right now, yeah. or, or exactly buy a, right any other. I mean, there, there are hacks on the existing NES consoles that allow you to run other emulators, right? Anyway, mm-hmm. So, I just I just struggled with the idea of it being $200 to start with, and then while well, it's really kind of an AMD powered mini PC, okay, and but it's not really going to be able to play modern games, and then it it it's delayed and delayed and delayed, it's been more than two years. It's getting more expensive. It's getting bloated. At some point, it's going to be this super niche enthusiast product where if you want a shell that looks like a, an Atari system, but it's really a mini PC, then get this. Yeah. But what will the thermals be like? And how what how uh, nicely made is it? Are you paying $300 for something that looks like a piece of crap when you actually get it in your hands? So... It's just uh, I can't believe we're still talking a about this. pie and a custom made <laughs> enclosure and just enjoy. You're What's getting into it? the territory where you could almost buy a 3D printer and make your own custom enclosure <laughs> and buy a Raspberry <laughs> Pi for two hundred eighty dollars. To your friend and give them a 3D printer and just sort of spread it. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you could find somebody on uh, AliExpress that'll sell you a copyright infringing case yes. that looks like a sadly their uh supplies are also running yeah, yeah. Right. you might have a delay on your shipment and you probably there's, sell, there's at least one seller there's at least one seller on etsy who will make you a raspberry pi case that looks like any of the vintage consoles or many like the old pcs like you get an atari st or an amiga 500 yeah. and pop your raspberry pi right in there am i allowed to physic or philosophically disagree with etsy though Yes. Philosophically disagree. Yes. Sure. No, I've gotten some decent stuff off there, but now they just won't stop. And I don't need your crochet patterns. I'm sorry. <laughs> Especially not well, for $300. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's uh, wrap up the news here today. We've got another story about a, a Dell vulnerability. What's going on here, Jeremy? Do people even still know what dude you're getting a Dell is? <laughs> We're closing in on 20 years for that campaign, so I'm sure there's yeah. a whole generation that has no idea. That that campaign was active and put Dell into my mind as a young PC it, buyer when I was, it was like a, 19. Yeah, that was effective. It marketing. was good. I mean, totally the guy looked, you from Gateway. Yeah, the kid, the kid, or the actor, like he had the vibe of like because I was in high school Keanu probably Reeves. at the time. He, he, I'm pretty sure they picked him because he looked kind of like Keanu Reeves. Oh, maybe, but I, I mean, he had, he had the vibe of kind of like a jerk, but. The, the pacing, the catchphrase, yeah, it absolutely pushed Dell into the minds of lots of people. But yeah. so and how Dell hypocritical assist. how hypocritical was it that they fired him as a spokesman because he was busted for weed? For, yeah, marijuana. And his entire 
characterization and the way they sold the computers was he's a stoner and he's trying to make Dell accessible and cool to the youth market. Yeah. That's that anyway, seems wrong. Oh, he's back a stoner then. and a dealer. It was it was naughty the back then that he was a stoner, yeah. But uh, what's what's going on nowadays with with Dell? Well, once again, uh, the very handy tool. There he is. Oh, you're right. No, it's uh, what's his face? Bill Winters. Uh, no, who played Bill? Something Winters. Bill Winters. I don't know. Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Ah, uh, he's. I don't who's come to who's me. the other one? Keanu Reeves. Who's Ted? Right. Theodore Ted who's, Esquire. Who's Bill? Uh, yeah, I'll, I gotta talk. I can't do the Google search. Someone in chat will come up and save me. I uh, <laughs> so Dell Support Assist is really freaking handy. Be you a business user or a personal user, because you just click. You go to the website. You say, "Hi, I'm looking for downloads. What's your service tag?" I don't know what my service. Oh, and it says, "Click here to detect your PC." So you click there so you don't have to dig up your service tag. Boom. Alex Winter. Damn it, I was right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and boom. All of your your new BIOS, your, your new drivers, everything's done. Away you go. One click. Wait for a minute. Beautifully done. If you encounter an issue and you're under warranty, you simply use the same Dell Support Assist app to go and talk to Dell get the warranty and they can remotely control your PC without you needing to install or download anything new because it lets you remotely access your PC. Which is the problem because now you've got something on your machine, which allows remote assistance and might not be regularly patched. And this has happened before and it will happen again that they have found there is a vulnerability that the people are able to get into the same protocols that the Dell technicians use to take over your machine uh, without you noticing it because one of the lovely things about it is that it doesn't necessarily take over your control of the mouse and keyboard. As they're doing their thing, you're still using your mouse just as normal. So, you know, they've got a new patch out. Uh, This was announced after the, the, uh, the vulnerability was mentioned. However, Honestly, this sort of stuff, I don't care if it's from Dell, from HP, from wherever. Download it, use it, remove it. That way, the next time you end up talking to somebody and needing it, you can download a fresh copy, which will have all the patches on it. Not to mention the fact that this is one of the products that does the same thing that registry cleaners and that did in the past, which is it runs in the background constantly sort of doing low level monitoring. It will pop up to remind you, well, you haven't done a scan of your hard drive. You haven't looked for problems recently. So it is sucking some cycles away. So just seriously, if, if you use this sort of support assist or remote assistance or whatever from your manufacturer, they're brilliant, but they're for very specific uses. Download it, use it, remove it. Run once, delete. All right. Uh, well, hey, we're going to take a quick break right now to thank our sponsor this week. We'll be right back. The new year is about growth and change. And if you're a business owner looking to grow your business, LinkedIn can help you find the right hires that can set you up for a strong year. And that's because it's not just about finding an employee. It's about finding the right employee. Hiring the right or wrong person can make or break your business and LinkedIn jobs helps you screen candidates with the hard and soft skills you're looking for. So you can find that right person fast. Things like collaboration, creativity, adaptability. LinkedIn looks beyond the traditional work skills and puts your job post in front of qualified candidates who match your business requirements perfectly. And that's because LinkedIn jobs can tie into the existing LinkedIn business network. Because the truth is, there is that right person out there for you, the right person to fill that role, to take your company to the next level. But that person may not be looking for a job in your field. They may not be looking for a job at all. And so with LinkedIn, identifying the right skills, the right talents, the right opportunities, they can put your job post in front of people who may not have even realized that a better opportunity was there. 
It's no wonder a person is hired every eight seconds with LinkedIn, and it's why companies rated LinkedIn Jobs the number one hiring platform for delivering quality hires. Find the right person for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash pcper. Again, that's linkedin.com slash pcper to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we're back. Uh, and uh, thanks so much to LinkedIn Jobs for sponsoring this week. Uh, all right, let's move on to the review portion of the show. We've got a couple reviews that we've had uh, hit over the last uh, couple weeks since we had our last show. Uh, first up is a motherboard review from Maury. He reviewed for us the Asus Tough Gaming X570 Plus. Uh, this is, uh, the again, the Asus's Tough series, which, uh, as we've talked about, as of uh, last year, I think early last year, sort of became Asus's uh, entry-level price point. Uh, prior to that, Tough had, you know, it was all about, you know, mil spec and camo design, and they still kind of have that, you know, those features, but primarily for what, you know, you as a consumer are interested in, it's their, their cheaper stuff, not, not lower quality, but just cheaper on the price. And uh, that's what we have here. This is an, an, a full X570 board. Uh, I think the price comes in at $190, $189.99 uh, is list price. So that's a pretty good price for an X570 board. And, uh, you know, Maury, uh, as if you're familiar with Maury's reviews, he has uh, incredibly detailed reviews. He goes through all the different features. He goes through the different bio screens. Uh, so we won't uh, read his review verbatim here, but overall he gave this board uh, high marks. He says it's got, uh, it's, it's, it's a good build quality. Uh, the clearance around the CPU is good in terms of accommodating, uh, the, the brackets for uh, CPU coolers and then the, the, the heat sink on those coolers uh, doesn't hit the VRM. It allows for uh, good clearance to the, uh, the top P uh, by 16 PCIe slot. Uh, it's got um, RGB headers on the board so you can do uh, RGB controlled uh, lighting through your motherboard software. It's got um, uh, two, two uh, by 16 slots, but unfortunately, that second slot is limited to by four mode. So it's not suitable for dual graphics. That's one of the negatives. But if you're running a single GPU, which is probably, you know, vast majority of the market, that's gonna be great there. It's got two M.2 SSDs, so uh, you can run both without uh, having to disable any uh, SATA ports, eight SATA ports, uh, a full array of, of input, including a uh, USB 3.2 type, or, I'm sorry, USB 3.2 Gen 2, uh, both the uh, type A and type C variants. So you've got flexibility there, onboard Wi-Fi, onboard uh, multi-channel analog audio, uh, built-in gigabit ethernet, uh, a PS2 uh, uh, port for your keyboard, uh, which is you know good to have for gaming, for the, you know, the keyboards that have the good end key rollover. Um, let me uh, jump down to the bottom here to hit his... Uh, Pros and cons. If you're watching the video, you can see there's just a ton of content, which is uh, yeah, uh, good for typical of Maury's reviews. Uh, so be sure to check that out if you're in the market for this board. Uh, in terms of of uh, performance, he compared. Uh, he looked at the uh, SATA and USB performance both on the chipset as well as on the uh, the processor, and uh, you know good performance overall. He compared it to some other boards, and uh, specifically the uh, Asus ROG Strix X570e and the ASRock X570 Steel Legend, and the performance is about on par. There's a little bit of variation uh, in some tests, which he chalks up to uh, just, you know, quirks in, in the testing between these different these different boards, because these were tested previously, uh, so it wasn't all, all together. But but overall, the, the, the key takeaway is this board is performing as expected. Uh, he said, you know, good for overclocking. Uh, and, uh, and overall, just a, a, a good, solid board at that price. You're not going to get all the bells and whistles. You don't get multi-gig Ethernet. Uh, you don't get uh, more uh, NVMe drives. You can't use dual graphics cards. But those are the kind of uh, trade-offs that you'd expect at this you know sub-$200 price point for X570. Uh, so he gave it a silver award. And uh, again, he says the, the, the weaknesses are... Uh, oh, I forgot, I forgot to mention. So there are two M.2 ports. Only one of them has that heatsink cover that we see on a lot of boards. So the other one will be open to the to the board, which isn't going to be a huge deal uh, for, for most use cases. 
And you can also get an aftermarket uh, heat sink to put on there if, if it really matters to you. But keep that in mind. You're not going to get that built-in motherboard uh, uh, heat sink cover uh, for both of those slots. Uh, also, the uh, the PCIe by one port is is blocked when you have the PCIe uh, uh, both by 16 ports populated. Uh, so, silver award for that uh, process or for that motherboard at 200 or I'm sorry, 190 dollars. The Asus Just, Tough Gaming X570 Plus. I think they have an impressive amount of features for X570 for this price level. Yeah, yeah for that price. Is, I don't see a Gen 2 header on the board. That's something that you really don't see on less expensive AMD boards. So that's that's a consideration. If you have a case that has that Type-C Gen 2 header or actual port on the case, you need the header on the board. You're not going to get that. Yeah. You have to use an adapter. But this is a budget board. And I will say the one thing about not having uh, heat sink covers for both M.2 slots there's two schools of thought. One, like Alan's thought, was you don't need it. In fact, you don't necessarily want it. And the second is a lot of these, this is a buy for, this is Gen 4. So this is, if you buy into the whole Gen 4 thing, you're buying an X570 motherboard. If you get a Gen 4 SSD, uh, the early ones that we looked at uh, have their own heat sinks because these are, that that one controller I believe it was Fizon, right? Fizon, Making yeah. this controller. Yep. It's hot. So they have they have to ship them with heat sinks. So you would not be able to use the factory heat sink from your board anyway. Uh the Corsair drive that I tested out you just it came with a heat sink. So so it, it, honestly, this is not a flashy board and I think that's probably something that I a lot of people have some RGB fatigue, I think, especially in our listening audience and Pretty freaking nice for 190 considering the amount of money that some of the x570 boards cost and the ones that i've tested i mean i've the last few reviews i've done any kind of x570 testing have been with the msi godlike board which i think is around 600 650 dollars yeah so all, all the companies all the manufacturers have their flagship boards that can reach into the I mean, at launch, they were 800 bucks, I think. I mean, oh, God, yeah. Yeah. No, it was crazy. Uh, very, very pricey. Also, he, you know, he does mention, too, that, and again, this, you know, this might be subjective, but from Mori's perspective, Asus has the best uh, EFI, UE, U, UEFI interface. Uh, it's responsive. It's well laid out. And so you get all that. You get the good stuff that you also get on those flagship Asus boards, but you get it at this price point. So the software, the uh, UEFI uh or slash you know bios interface is, is all there for you so and before you laugh at responsive bios uh just try using certain ones where you move your mouse and then like a full second later the cursor starts to yeah meet up with where you expected it to be i mean it wasn't that long up ago. on american medical <sighs> trends <laughs> It, yeah. it wasn't that long ago that there was no mouse i mean that mouse input in, in a bios was a novel thing that was I yeah, it showed it. up. It showed up in the '90s a few times. I've used some point-and-click BIOS on old compact computers from the mid to late '90s, but yeah, now it's commonplace. But the performance is shockingly bad on a lot of them. So I do appreciate his excruciating attention to detail on every single screen of the UEFI BIOS. He has a screenshot. It's worth yeah. looking at his reviews just to see what the BIOS is like. What, what does it have? This feature does it have a toggle for that? It's all here. He it's captured. actually better than the manual. Yes, it is. Yes. I'm sorry, Mori does better stuff than the manuals do. Every one of his reviews is like a resume for a technical writing position. So yeah, exactly. So even even if it's not this board, if you if you if you're interested in a board, and Mori has reviewed that board or a similar board, yeah, check out the review. Search for it at PC Per, and you can. And if see. you're interested in a board, harass Mori into reviewing it. That's true. Yeah. His home address will be provided to uh, anyone who wants yes. to. All personal contact information. Can For anyone who provides a board. Uh, well, it, pa oh, Patreons yeah. only. Pa Patreons. Oh, uh, it's true. Only. Yes. Yeah. It's an exclusive tier. But uh, next up in our review uh, list here, we've got something from Sebastian. You reviewed the uh, Orico. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. I've never heard it said out loud. I think of it as Orico. Orico. But I have no okay. idea. Well, the O-R-I-C-O. 
Wasn't yes. that the the guy on uh, He Man? I don't know. I didn't watch the He-Man. floating wizard dude. Oh no, that I was never... Orko. Sorry. I... What well, you never watched the old well, He Man cartoons? I've I never not. saw He Man. No. Good. I don't know gosh. how I missed it, but I didn't see it. I saw Turtles. I, I watched young. Transformers. Yeah, Turtles, Transformers, GI Joe. Yep. No He Man. Gargoyles. No. Yeah. See, you're too young. Yeah, it's probably. Miss, must probably be like a competing story. competing network at the same time slot on Saturday morning or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Orico, we we looked at an enclosure from them a while back. It was last year at some point, and it was this little aluminum NVMe enclosure, which was actually surprisingly nice. I was very impressed by what I considered to be. Here's this no name Amazon company, and we get solicited a lot of products, which ninety five percent of them I just either ignore or reject politely. This is one where I'm like, you know what? Honestly, this looks okay, and I haven't tested one of these. Go ahead and send it. And it was impressive, and it wasn't overpriced. So when they offered to send more stuff, uh, I eventually agreed to take a couple of enclosures. And this is a dual bay, three and a half inch drive enclosure. But it's not just a stock dual bay drive enclosure. It has a cloning function. So it's an offline clone dock. But it's not just an offline clone dock. It's not like a, a just an appliance. It works both ways. So it's got a kind of a pretty standard J Micron chipset in it. That's a SATA to USB bridge, and it's not going to break any speed records. This particular controller, it doesn't even saturate USB three. So you're getting transfer speeds. I saw transfer speeds of up to about 400 megabytes a second. It does support concurrent use of two drives but you're sharing bandwidth this is uh even though this is offered in both a usb 3.0 and a usb type c version the difference between them is literally just the connection on the back of the unit itself the chipset's the same speed is the same they're both five gigabit per second usb devices so if you have two drives installed concurrently you literally are limited to about 200 megabytes a second per drive instead of up to 400 for a single drive. So do bear that in mind. Uh, It, they do say that, and I did not actually figure out a effective way to test this. Uh, At least I wasn't smart enough to come up with one in the timeframe allowed to figure out if it hits the up to 300 megabytes per second clone speed, internal speed of actually copying a drive. Cloning didn't take all that long, but I didn't stick around to actually watch it through the entire 480 gigabyte SSD drive clone uh, that I performed. But that does work. It was reliable in all the uses that I put it through. I will say I did get it to stall out, though, when I was forcing large file transfers uh, simultaneously to and from both drives. And at one point, transfer just completely stopped on drive a while drive B is completed. And then as soon as drive B's was done, drive a picked right back up again at full speed. And it basically took about the same amount of time. That's the thing. One was going at 350 megabytes per second. The other one stopped and it finished at the same speed, but something like that, I think uh, Alan back in the day would have had fun with, and it, we all know that he had a reputation for backing controllers into a corner especially if they were made by J Micron, which unfortunately had kind of a bad reputation in the beginning of the SSD era. But this is a very solid little device. We're not talking about something that's going to cost you a bunch of money. It's $35, $36 on Amazon, depending on which version you get. I think uh, when I published the review, they were going for like $36.99 and $34.99, depending on whether you got USB-C or USB-3. And then there was another like 5% coupon code on top of it on Amazon. So they're not expensive. They're about the same price as the drives bays like this from like Sabrent. Uh, a couple of differences. These are open top. They don't have any flaps. And a lot of them that you look at on Amazon have flaps, like spring loaded flaps, like a VCR, which dates me considerably. But these don't have that, which is totally fine for a three and a half inch drive. But if you put in an SSD, there's nothing supporting it laterally. So don't perform a very delicate drive cloning operation uh, with this like on the dining room table with your kid running around because maybe they could smash into one of the drives and break the SATA controller or something. But uh, 
it's it was perfectly robust in my usage. The one huge caveat was that the power cord that comes with it is very short. It's like three feet long. It's the same length as the USB cable that comes in the box. So it barely reached the floor from my desk. And I had it on the edge of the desk too. I could still barely plug the power cord into the strip at the bottom. So depending on the height of your desk, this could be a problem. So if you use a standing desk, hopefully you have a power strip behind the desk, uh, uh, like up higher where you can actually reach the cord. But that was it. Everything else was fine. And not doing quality control on it or anything. I know that was one of the complaints I had about the last Oracle review that we published was, you know, I got one of these and a week later I had a problem or something like I used that one for a month. I think I used this one for about two weeks. So the amount of time we actually spend with review units varies, but in my time with it, it read everything up to a 10 terabyte hard drive, any SSD I put in it, cloned operation successfully between two SSDs. Um, no real complaints. And you know, it's it's not a bad looking unit either. It's part of their transparent series, which uh, it's made out of clear plastic. So you can see all the innards. I could actually look in at that J Micron controller and see exactly which one they were using. So that's comforting. Like you can actually see the board inside and it has lighting, it has little lights that blink when it's in use. All right. Well, that's uh, you didn't like those lights. I thought I was alone sure. on the call. I was just waiting <laughs> for someone else to speak. You, you didn't like the lights. Oh, I didn't like the way the lights worked because if you look through the clear plastic, one light is labeled twenty five percent. The next one is fifty. The next one is seventy five, and then the last one is one hundred percent. And I'm thinking, oh, during this clone operation, I'll be able to come back into the room every so often and see if it's at twenty five percent or if it's moved up to fifty percent. When it was done, they were all lit indicating 100%. But during the operation, it was just this scrolling marquee back and forth, like blink, 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 blink. And it never showed me how far along it was. I thought it was an it was in an error state. So I was actually a little nervous thinking, oh, great, I just blew my GPU testbed SSD for no reason. And uh, in fact, it was totally fine when it was completed. And I read the actual documentation, which I had you know, been reluctant to do. And it said specifically, to expect a scrolling marquee during the operation. So if I just read the damn manual, I would have known that. I just don't understand why they printed 25, 50, 75% if it doesn't actually indicate progress. So just ignore those numbers, pretend it's not transparent, and it works exactly like you'd expect a $35 USB uh, hard drive dock to act. So the lights are just as effective as the blue bar on the copy. Mm -hmm. 99%. 99%, 99%, yeah. 99%. 43 years remaining, 44 years, 26 days, 32 minutes. Two remaining. minutes. Yes. Yeah. 3D and then that one tiny freaking file finishes its transfer, and then the thing finishes in like five minutes. <laughs> We've all been there. What were we talking about again? Uh, anyway, let's, uh, so, so uh, if you're interested in a inexpensive drive dock with cloning functionality, check out Sebastian's review of the Orco. Is that what we settled on? Orco? Or Orico, yes. Orico. Like Orico. Oracle, but if you had a speech impediment. Drive doc. All right, next up, let's finish our reviews for the week. We've got a, a case review, another one from Kent Burgess. Uh, Sebastian, I think you put this in the system for us. So, uh, and of course, also, way, you, you being the case expert. Yeah, I judged it harshly. And you know what? He passed. Kent, I think with this review... Kent, if you're watching, you've arrived. This is peak Kent Burgess here. And I, I mean that, I don't mean it to be a pun, but it is. And it, he's he's arrived. It's, it's fantastic photography. He's thoughtful with his build choices. He's putting it through its paces. It was a good review. And you know what? It's a freaking awesome build. If you're watching the video or if you look at this review on the site, he did a hardline tubing full out liquid build and he completely encompassed the entire interior of the case he has radiators up front on top on the case floor fans imagine in the if jj abrams That's built a case but with less lens flare and more right. finesse. Well, yeah and you know what if it weren't for the fact gorgeous. that he was using filters there would be some freaking lens flare in these in these 
pictures. I, I know. Let, let's uh, real quick, uh, because the, the, the focus of the review is not Kent's beautiful system build, but <laughs> the case itself, let's clarify, this is the Fantex Enthu 719. It's a full and tower case. By the case. way, there's, there's a story behind the name. In fact, he, he titled the review A Case by Any Other Name. Because if you're familiar with Fantex and their Enthu series, they had this big case called the Lux. And the Enthu Lux uh, successor was teased, I think it was CES 2019. They showed the Lux 2. And that's what this case is. But another company said, hey, we have the rights to that name, or we have a, a product that's similar enough to that that you can't do that. So they actually went to the extreme of, they didn't fight it at all. It was thermal take. They said, no, you can have it. We're not going to fight you. We're just going to change the name of our product. So instead of releasing the Lux 2, they released the 719. I don't know if that was their code name internally for it or what. And that's what this is. So if you're confused by the name, this is the Lux successor, but they couldn't call it the Lux 2. Uh, and it's a full tower enclosure. This is not a mid tower. This is a big case. And in fact, it's dual system capable. And if you're familiar with, again, the big Fantex cases that could support a full up to EAT export on one side and then have a mini IT export on the other and actually support two power supplies, two systems concurrently, you can do that with this. Uh, he did not do that for this build. He went with that all out liquid cooled build, but it does support it. And he said it even has the brackets included, so you can mount your mini uh, or your yeah your mini ITX motherboard in here without purchasing additional components. Storage support's very good. One of the unique things about this case actually is the back. You you normally you have a tempered glass side panel, and that's expected. The rear panel of this case has a tempered glass window to show off your SSD collection. So if you happen to have two or three SSDs to line up in the back. And it has those SSD trays below the motherboard cut out like we see a lot. They'll be on full display when your build is done because there's a window back there. So that's interesting. It doesn't show all your cable mess. It just shows the SSDs, which is kind of nice. I feel like this is a case that uh, a storage uh, fan must have had something to do with the design process. Like it's, it's all about storage. There's these interesting pop out two and a half inch SSD mounts on the inside it's got those three showcased SSD mounts on the back. So really it's it's about like cooling capacity and storage, which is a nice combo for a case. Although he did have, Kent had some kind of issues during the build process. And I've seen some of his complaints echoed in reviews out there if you look on Newegg or Amazon. So it's it's a little finicky with the build depending on what you're doing, what components you're using, if you're going all out with radiators, et cetera, clearances are great until you run into issues with, well, a particular radiator on the bottom, that sort of thing. So he, he said that, I'll just quote, due to some of the design choices Fantex made, building in the 719 requires an attention to detail and component specs that goes a little beyond any other case I've previously used. However, if you work within the limitations, this additional case, the additional care is worth it as you will be rewarded with an excellent system in the end, end quote. So I butcher that quote horribly, but that was kind of his his whole journey with this case was. It's a little finicky, but in the end, it's great. And he thought airflow was very good, which, you know, kind of matters with a case, even though it has a solid front panel, there are pretty big uh, gaps, uh, larger vents, and screen filters, of course, everywhere, as with all of these sort of high-end cases. And he said it was kind of, he, he uses a, a standardized airflow test he came up with where he uses the same fan in all these different enclosures. And this does not come with any fans. So it's literally going to be up to you how loud it is. But it was right up there. It was up there just behind the Fantex P400A, which is a high airflow case, by the way, in overall performance. So very good of the cases he's tested recently. And... Not terribly expensive. That was the last thing. It's you look at this, you see the stuff it is capable of supporting and how large it is. It's a full tower, tempered glass side panel, some interesting design features. One eighty nine. So same price as that motherboard we were talking about. Not too bad, I don't think. Not in the era of two hundred to two hundred fifty dollar premium cases, anyway. But keep in mind uh, when you look at this review, you gotta 
ignore Kent's gorgeous hardline liquid cooling build because yours will probably not look like that. Stick stick to the empty pictures and making your choices because you can look at something like that and think, oh, that's amazing. But, you know, I can't build a case like or build a system like that. So I got to. I gotta stick I'm going with actually to the Fantex site just to see. Did they even use a build like this for their photos? I don't think so. Not even their own promotional images show a build like this. But, you know, he's showing off a little bit, and I respect that. Oh, they do have a hardline build in one of their photos. That's nice. But, yeah, I mean, my piece of crap single GPU ATX build, you know, where I just tuck all the cables back behind so you can't see the mess. That's not maybe taking full advantage of a case like this. I would not buy a full tower case like this to do a simple ATX build. So it's it's not for everyone. And obviously, Fantex has a huge line of cases anyway, if you're interested in their their company and what they have to offer. But I like it. And apparently he did too. Uh, you know, it's it's not perfect, but we're we're all chasing that perfect computer enclosure. At least I still am six years down the road yeah well but if you're as, as ken said if, if you have an attention to detail you, you can look at a case like this and and cause you know design your your component selection and your cooling layout around it that's a big case with a lot of features in it uh, for for a relatively low price i mean because you look at somebody yeah. you know like the, the the flagship cases from like corsair are 500 bucks you know the 900d or whatever what was the price on that oh yeah that's up there and, and really even it's kind of like starts at 119 really like 119 179 i think the last carbide i looked at was 179 and then we're up into like the 200 249 dollar range yeah. so there, there that, are so this is this is a, a for this size and the the feature set in terms of flexibility for storage and and, and cooling it's, it's pretty good at, at, at about 190 dollars. so Plus, check that out I mean, the, that anthracite gray color that he reviewed. Oh. I don't think he really talked about the color very much. That's sort of a unique looking case. And it's gray inside and out, accented by black. And it well, also it comes match, in a uh, Maury's uh, X570. Yeah. It, it's a very similar it would be a color. nice look. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a military kind of high tech look to it. I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's got that that tough feel. All right, so that's the the Enthu Seven Fantex Enthu Seven Nineteen. Check out the full review and all of Kent's great photography and his uh, his great build. And uh, uh, I don't know, but, you know, maybe maybe get, send Kent an email if you want him. Maybe he'll build you a system. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I'm sure his rates are negotiable. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just contact him again. That Patreon tier, we will shock and horrify some of our contributors with unsolicited uh, exposure to their personal contact information. You know, for the rest. If you're not used to it by now, well, you will be. Right. Right. All right. Well, that's the news and reviews for this week. Let's jump into the picks of the week. Uh, I'll start off first. Uh, So I've, I had to move a bunch of stuff to get to this new location. And and then also just in general, uh, keeping uh, cables together and then once you're there to set them up you know routing them grouping them tying them to a leg and all that i used to use zip ties and and you know that's fine but zip ties can be uh they, they can tighten too tight and damage the cable um they can you know hurt you if you cut off the excess and it comes off at an angle it leaves something sharp that can <laughs> cut your finger when you go to grab it and of course they're, they're single use you, when you zip tie something it's it's on there for good and and uh if you want to remove a cable or run a new cable or move a, a grouping of cables, you've got to cut it and throw out that plastic and and put on a new one. Well, uh, this is something I've been using for a long time. I, I picked these up on Amazon. They're they're not very expensive. These are Velcro uh, cable ties, basically, and they're uh, they're. I guess you can get about a hundred of them for eight or nine dollars. Uh, shit that's not bad yeah they're they're not expensive they're a good uh they come in different lengths and different co- uh, quantities uh i usually buy the eight and a half inch those are, are, are generally adequate for most needs and they're there's reusable they're soft so you don't cut yourself uh you can use them i use them for everything from uh storing cables you know wrapping them to, to, for storage or transport as well as when i get to a new a new setup and I need to route cables. I use them to, to to bundle them together for routing. 
And uh, if, if you do need uh, to, uh, you know, if you want to wrap it around a, a, a desk leg or something and it's not long enough, you can combine a couple of them together and make an extra long uh, cable. So uh, if, just check these out. They're, 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 they're great. I've, I've bought a bunch of these. I use them everywhere and uh, just super handy to have. So these are the Velcro uh, brand uh, cable ties. They're over at Amazon. Currently, a hundred of them are going for about eight. Uh, let's see, eight dollars and sixty-five cents. So uh, that's American. Sorry, Jeremy. I don't know what the uh, Canadian prices are, but sixty-three dollars Canadian. But hey, you know. All right. Uh, let's see. Next. And up, you know what? Hey, they uh, come in uh, gray. Seventeen eighty-five. Oh, by oh. the way. Seventeen eighty-five. Jeez. Yeah. No, that's uh, actually a ripoff, and it's not on sale. Yeah. Don't pay that. Even I mean, no. even a Canadian, don't pay that. But, uh, all right, Jeremy, what's your pick for this week? I, I ran into this today and I'm trying to be nice. So I'm just curious. Is there anyone who watches this podcast that gets the point of the Cougar blazer? It, it's a case that is, oh no, you, you got to click through to the review. Like I tried to capture it. it there's no possible freaking way to capture what this is. It's very orange. It's very branded. It is open or it is open air. So essentially you've got two glass panels on the side, which can or cannot be installed. But you look at the back panel there. You notice how securely your uh, cards are attached to the case and and how well protected your back plate is and just the sheer orangeness of it it's <laughs> I, I there has to be someone it, it, if they made this case there has to be somebody out there that wants it i don't know who they are i there's where you put your, uh, the one nice thing about it is that you can actually hide uh, two, three and a half, or yeah, two, three and a halfs and a two and a half or three, two and a halfs on the back. You've got this little tiny front plate with uh, the reset and just normal USB, but it's, it's, it's half cut off because of the open design of it. I just, I mean, in theory, as they pointed out, you can fit in some decent water cooling and if you leave the side panels off you're you're going to get some decent cooling performance out of it but i i just like is it just me it's, it's like I an mean, open test bench but without the convenience of accessibility to some of your points. or you know the aesthetics of an open test bench yeah. to be honest just the cables just running along the back there yeah it's, it's 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 very similar to the D frame series from Inwin, which is essentially the same concept. You have a frame. kind of, but they did it better. Is, oh, Inwin, is, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're kind of the masters, but this is of, oh yes, you know, if you're very good. It's interesting, but yeah, it's very orange. I kind of like the orange gray kind of aesthetic myself, but. Cougar is a brand that I feel like maybe it was not really over here. And now, of course, in the global Amazon economy, it's available yeah. to anybody. But that was something where I think if I ever asked them for anything, it was they just weren't in our country, region, that sort of thing. It's There's been such an explosion of enclosure makers. But I have heard of the Cougar brand. Of course, they make accessories too, right? They make like keyboards and... Yeah. No, I mean, they're... they're... Peripherals and stuff now. They're making in ways. Yeah. And when I first looked at it, I was hoping, oh, you know, are those heat pipes? You know, is, is that actually channeling heat away from your PSU or something? Do you want it to? Jeremy, is that what you want them to be? I mean, because it would be an improvement. That could be arranged. I mean, thermal paste and maybe a couple of pipes, and you could make that happen. <laughs> How good are you at soldering or welding? I'm shite. Okay. Well, uh, the generally, this could be the basis a, of a. Go ahead. Okay, I was going to say I'm not generally against Cougar. They've put out some really exp inexpensive, decent cases. This one, I just, I, I don't. 
No. No. Yeah, it's it's a little weird. I don't. It's it, not. It looks it's not like what I'm a fanless. For. It looks like a fanless thing. Like you'd see this at, at fanless tech or somewhere, and all those fins are taking heat away from the core i3 processor in the build or something. And here it's just, <laughs> it's just trim. Yeah. Still just blowing air around with no filters. It's fine. Well, Modders Inc. gave it a recommendation. They won the there you recommended go. hardware it's... badge. So. Each, each mean, their hey, own. Tempered glass on both sides. That's nice. Well, maybe if the tempered glass, especially on the back side, it was tinted or something, you know, a little yeah, fog on it, so it couldn't quite see the. Well, whatever. Okay, I'm glad uh, to know I'm not the only one that's just a little bit standoffish about this. Yeah. All right, Sebastian, what do you got for us? Uh, other than a running furnace a few feet away from me, I have uh, anti PC pick, and this is only because lately. I don't know why. We go through these phases in my house where consoles will have been put away for six months or a year. And then randomly I'll move things around the living room and like, oh, hey, I should hook up this console again. So I'll like bring it up out of the bedroom or bring it out of the basement and put it back upstairs. And recently, this I don't even know Witcher why. This game it, looks bad. It's, it, you know, it, and I will say he's the worst character in the game that I've tried. But. This is Soul Calibur 6. It's not a brand new game. I think it came out at the end of 2018. But it's really cheap now. It was it's around 20 bucks uh to, for the physical copy and it was down to 15 on the PlayStation Store the other day. So I picked it up. Soul Calibur and Soul Calibur 2 are like household favorites and my wife's a big Soul Calibur 2 fan. So I'm like, "Hey, let's get Soul Calibur 6." We hooked up the PS4 again recently. I actually loaded up a save and like looked at the date like, "Wow, uh 2016 was the last time I played this game. So obviously we weren't playing the console at all because I just don't have time. But my son is kind of getting into video games. Not that I'm letting him play Soul Calibur 6. He's only four. Although he does find it very exciting when they're beating the crap out of each other. But hey, it's just like Soul Calibur 2, only with prettier graphics. And it runs on the PS4. And it's cheap. Mommy and you and can Daddy make are your fighting, but with their clothes on? Uh, well, or off, you can make your own character and uh, uh, dress or undress them in various levels. And by the way, my wife and I had a competition who could create the best character, which of course is what we really did with the game. We spent like two hours each making these stupid characters we'll never use. And uh, she made one that was like this tall, blonde warrior lady. And then I made one, which I'll just have to at some point get a picture. It's disturbing i guess is the best way to think about it but i will say as large as he is he has such he moves with such grace and speed and you know he really pulls off those hot pants that i put on him so you know just ignore the body hair yeah ignore the body hair and the fact that i turned every dial up to you know max as far as uh his physical size and heft. Yeah, he's he's not quite not quite that, Jordan, in our chat. But anyway, it's fun. Maximum it's girth. A fun, it's a fun, yeah, exactly. And I will say it it helps because if you have a lot of size, <laughs> that does think, not of a help. Sumo, think of a sumo wrestler. Audio listeners, you are lucky right now. No, no. <laughs> think of a sumo wrestler, but in hot pants, and he uses these little I can't remember what they're called. They're from one of the female characters because you can pick a template like, how do you want them to fight? And like, oh, her fighting style. So then he's he he moves in a very, you know, I don't want to be offensive, but he moves in a very feminine way. He has a gentle way about him. He's very fast. And uh, it's it's such an advantage because his physical size, you can back somebody up against a wall and just slash the crap out of him. And I really think I've I've designed the ultimate fighter in soul caliber six so if if i could upload this character somewhere and share it with the world i should his name is bunny and uh i don't know i i was proud of myself but you can do it yourself get soul caliber six and see if you can make a better character than i did all right never played a soul caliber game 
myself. No, neither have I. They're good. They're the ones that have the gimmick. Like uh, uh, he mentioned, Witcher. Like Geralt is his name. Geralt. Ger- in, in the Witcher. Yeah. yeah. Geralt. So he's the he's the bonus character on the PlayStation version. The Nintendo versions, like Soul Calibur Two on GameCube back in the day, you could play as Link. Mm. So there, there's like a tie-in with whatever console it's on. But, and they have like a Yoda. I remember seeing something about Yoda in a fighting game. Oh, probably. Yeah, I miss the old arcade one where you got to play Ash. Ash from Pokemon. Oh okay. no, <laughs> Groovy Ash. All right. Well, that's like our... Bruce Campbell. What? No Bruce Campbell fans here. Oh, Ash from Evil Dead. Oh, okay. okay. All right. All right. I didn't know. I I, I was thinking Burn Notice. Well, I'm the same <laughs> character. <laughs> you watch we forget that Jim is the youngest back. one here. They've got two seasons of Ash being back. Yes, that's they. They did have a recent like TV. Oh, it, it's freaking brilliant. Oh, nice. I'll check it out. By the way, Jordan in the chat uh, confirms Yoda and Vader were in previous incarnations of Soul Calibur. Oh, I didn't great. play anything between two and six, so I have mm. no idea. Yeah. All right. Well, that's that's our show this week, uh, folks. I uh, apologize if uh, my audio had a bit of an echo. As you can see, I'm in this big empty room, and we'll remedy that by putting in some rugs, blankets, used mattresses, whatever. We'll, we'll work on that for next week. Uh, but uh, we're glad you could join us, and uh, we now have our, our fiber upload that we've uh, been talking about. So uh, hopefully this, this uh, live stream looks a little better. If you're watching on demand, you won't notice anything because that always gets uploaded. It's good for me because I can upload the final edit much faster. Uh, but oh, going okay. forward, if, if you want to join us live, we're, we're hoping now that we have that bandwidth, we want to reintroduce our, our Twitch simulcast. Uh, if you recall back under mm. the old days of the church, we used to – simulcast both to youtube and twitch and we should be able to get that going we didn't want to do it this week because this is our first week with fiber we want to make sure nothing broke so uh if it looks like everything went okay and and we'll look to get that going next week and then also because we have the bandwidth you know we can do maybe 4k uploads too now so oh lord we'll we'll look into that we'll we'll, uh get even more resolution of all of your you you really don't want that you'll have to upscale me because I'm I'm at 1080p. I don't I don't want to. Well, buy a so camera. even if you're at 1080p, that that's all right. Because with four 1080p signals here on our our uh, oh, I see with thing, the the multi view, yeah. mm-hmm. that's wow. almost like 4K. Now when I when I go full screen, we'll have to do some some upscaling. Yeah, but... you don't want to see me at full screen. That's and of course, uh, Josh will be back next week. Uh, his uh, his walrus avatar graced us and blessed us uh, this this week up in that upper right corner. He'll be back uh, next time, and uh, we hope you will be too. So, thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.